Hey there everyone, what's up? It's nighttime here in Tokyo, and I have work to do, so what's a better time to do a, an impressions video when I should be working? <laughs> right now, I guess. We're going to talk about Seven Dragon 2022. Now, Seven Dragon 2022 is a sequel to Seven Dragon 2020, and... This is a third-person dungeon crawler made by... This is made by Image Epoch, but published by Sega. It uses Sega characters. Uh, Hatsune Miku shows up in this. But it is developed by Image Epoch. But whatever. It's a Sega franchise made by Sega, put out by Sega, and it's good. <laughs> it's really good. So let's get into this. Why is this so good? Why did I enjoy this game? So Seven Dragon 2020 takes place in the story one year after Seven Dragon 2020 and 2022 starts after the first game so in the first game dragons invade the world I guess and everyone everything gets destroyed by the dragons and you have to fight the dragons in the first game and after you beat the dragons in the first game one year later this game shows up and the dragons come back and you're tasked with fighting more dragons but uh, it's a little different from the first game in some ways. The story is a bit different. Uh, I'll talk about the story more later because there are some really good parts to it. But uh, let's talk about the mechanics, I think, that are different from the first game. First, there's more character classes. In this, in this one, you have the new character class, the Idol, which is really good. But I will explain. There's six classes altogether. There's the Samurai, the Destroyer. These are your cut two melee type classes. Uh, you have a Trickster. The Trickster uses guns and does a lot of kind of cool stuff. <laughs> Let's put it that way. There's a lot of like reaction things that are really good in, with the Trickster. Um, the Psychic, which is kind of like your mage, has some other abilities. The Idol, which is like a crowd control kind of character. And who am I forgetting? Ah, Hacker. The Hacker uh, uses computers to hack into enemies. So you can actually hack into the enemies and control them or cause them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Uh, it's, it's a pretty cool class, actually. I didn't really use it this, in this playthrough, but I used it in the first playthrough, the first game, and it was pretty awesome. But... Anyway, you've got these classes, and you make your characters from these classes, and you can make as many as you want, and build your party however you want. And they're all balanced really well, much better than in the first game, where in the first game, the Trickster was ridiculously overpowered. <laughs> like, ridiculously overpowered. You could beat everything with the Trickster. Um, but in this one, the Trickster's been kind of nerfed, and all the other classes have been built in a way that they're all viable. So if you wanted to make a, a party with three idols, you could do it. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a bad party, probably. You could make three destroyers if you wanted to. Um, it might be a little rough at points, but you could do it. They would be a viable party. And I think that's one of the good things about this game, is that it's balanced really well, and building parties is fun because of it. So... I really enjoyed my party. In this game, I used a destroyer, a psychic, and an idol for my party, and it was good. They, all of those classes gave me a wide range of kind of strategies I could use, and I had no trouble coming up with strategies to beat even the tougher bosses. So, good way to play the game. So, first let's talk about... Okay, in the character creation, it's done really well. It's really good I think <laughs> a lot besides the classes you have a lot of options for how your characters look you have options for their colors and 15 different voices for each character all done by really high quality uh, voice actors so it's done really well there's a lot of options and they're all really good ones so it's quite it's quite good and let's see beyond the character creation you have the dungeons which is the most important thing really in a dungeon crawler and this game 
they're all good, but they're if you played the first game, 2020, you'll know you'll you'll recognize some of the dungeons because they're straight up reused. They're not um they're not changed in any way, um, except usually the reused dungeons are different in some way than the other one. They're not laid out any differently, but the way you access the areas is different. In the first game, there was lots of kind of puzzles in the dungeons to open areas up and to get to certain areas and this time they're usually all unlocked already and you can you have different obstacles to get through to get to different areas so it's done pretty well in that even the reused dungeons they feel a little bit different in that you know you don't have to do the same exact thing over and over again so at least there's that it's not completely unforgivable just mostly unforgivable and I'm, I'm saying that not because they reused like one or two gen dungeons, there's a lot of dungeon reuses. And I think, thankfully, the reused dungeons are pretty short for the most part, but they could have <laughs> they could have made a few more, I think, and used a little less of the old ones. Or at least extended the old ones, so like half reused them, but they, uh, that's probably my only complaint about the um, dungeons though they all look really nice and i think they took into account the way that uh, the people reacted to the original dungeons so i everyone always talked about ikebukuro being really cool looking and it is really cool looking the whole stage is like this kind of twisted mass of railroad tracks that extends off into the sky it's really cool looking and that makes a reappearance but they also made a couple of new stages that are pretty similar in style so you have like this kind of smashed up train station that's uh you know the the stage is built out of weird platforms of the smashed up train station and parts of the trains it's they're all kind of twisted together and and extended across areas it's really cool looking and there's another stage that's uh you know parts of buildings have been made into this kind of descending abyss it's really cool they all the stages look really nice and they're all colorful and they're all laid out really well. You really have to, you really have to experience it. It's it's such a really kind of cool design for all the stages, and everything in the game is pretty cool looking. Like the character designs are really nice looking, even though the models are that kind of chibi, big head, little body kind of thing going on. They they manage to make it cool. Like they all look really stylish. All the characters look like they popped out of a fashion magazine or something, and it's really nice looking. I really enjoyed the character art style for this game, which is not something I have said often. <laughs> so I, I really liked the how the stages were made, and I really liked how the characters looked. And then you have the music, and generally I don't talk a lot about the music for games, for the most part, unless there's something special about it. And there is something special about this one, because it's really good. The battle, the battle theme is really like high energy real a lot of fun to listen to and even the all the stage music is really good and that's probably because the composer is yuzo koshiro who did um uh, of course streets of rage and Etrian odyssey and a million other soundtracks that everybody knows so again he's a top notch top of his game in this game because uh it's really good. I really enjoyed the soundtrack. And if you're not a super big fan of it, the soundtrack, halfway through the game you can change it to Hatsune Miku. If you like Miku, you can play this game and get your Hatsune Miku fix as the background music for everything halfway through the game. So even if you just got tired of the previous soundtrack, you could switch it over to the Hatsune Miku tracks and you'd be probably okay for the rest of the game. So it gives you, gives you some options. I didn't usually listen to the Miku tracks. I just left it with the Yuzo Koshiro soundtrack, and it was good. So what else? What else is there? Uh, I, I want to talk about the story a little bit. I don't want to give any spoilers. Well, nothing major at least. But the story is really good. I mean, it's a pretty basic story, but within the story, they do things that are unexpected for like you kind of expect it to be this kind of generic story. But then all of a sudden, like, they go way beyond what you would expect them to. So, right in the first part of the game, like, one of the main characters from the first game gets messed up, like, <laughs> totally screwed up. Like, um, it's like one second he's, like, trying to save someone, the next mi minute he's, like, a cripple amputee. Like, they just wrecked that character. 
And then they have no qualms about partway through the game, just killing people off, like main characters, just dead. It's, uh, they go all out. It's not like, uh, uh, they don't pull any punches. It's actually, like, it's weird because the, the, the feel of the game, even though it's like this kind of post-apocalyptic dragons are attacking thing, is kind of up-tempo because of how everything is very colorful and the music is really, like, upbeat. But all of a sudden, sometimes, like, it just gets dark, like people are dying. And it happens enough that, like, it kind of changes the tone of the game to be a bit different than you'd expect. And it's it's weird because sometimes you'll be going through the stage and you have to save people, like random citizens who are just, like, out in the maps. And sometimes you'll run across them and they'll be, like, freaking out and they'll panic and they'll just run off into a poison trap and kill themselves. It happens, like, it's not the kind of thing you expect, especially because the game is uh, so bright and upbeat. But sometimes it just gets dark all of a sudden, and I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was really a, kind of a nice touch. It gave, like, some more realistic reactions for some people. And sometimes there's, like, you know, the previous game did that too, but this one kind of steps it up a notch. It's a really kind of a cool thing. Um, I'm trying to think about what else I want to say about this. I really enjoyed it. Uh, let me talk about the difficulty, because it's something I've kind of been complaining about recently for a lot of games. Um, this game has a really nice difficulty setting. Uh, I played on just a normal setting, and it's it's good. It feels like a normal setting. You don't have, you don't have parts that are ridiculously easy, and it didn't feel too easy ever. And there are parts that are a challenge. So, nothing that was like, oh my god, this is so hard, but um, there were parts where I had to think about what I was doing, which is all I ask for, really, in my games that I'm playing. I, I want parts where I have to actually utilize the way I built my party to defeat bosses. I want to have to think of a strategy and use the skills I've chosen in a way that makes it possible for me to beat a boss that I couldn't normally beat just by pressing the A button over and over. And this game does that. It gives me the opportunity to have to think about various strategies and I couldn't use the same strategy against every boss I had to think of different ones using the same base set of skills and it worked this game works that way you can do that and I appreciate that so much it's done so well and it's weird because Image Epoch is the, the developer and they are for me they are totally hit and miss sometimes they make some really good stuff and sometimes they make some terrible stuff but this time, knocked it out of the park. Good stuff. Seven Dragon 2020, I would highly, rec highly, highly recommend this game. Um, the only downside, it's probably unplayable if you can't read Japanese. Um, I doubt there's a fan translation. It's pretty new, came out last in 2013, so it's not an old game. And even though it's a it was really popular, there's no way that Sega is going to localize the PSP game now. So there's probably no chance for you guys to play it in anything but Japanese, but it is definitely worth playing, and definitely worth uh, importing if you can even remotely understand Japanese. And I, I'm saying that because, like, a lot of the times you have to be able to figure out where you're supposed to go, and they'll tell you about it in the dialogue. And if you don't read it, if you can't read the dialogue, you'll never figure out what you're supposed to be doing. You'll just get stuck too much. It happens too much without being able to read is what I, I mean. Um, so I, I wouldn't really recommend it if you couldn't speak Japanese or read Japanese is what I mean. So beyond that, that's probably the only downside, the only real downside to uh, playing the game. Everything else great. It's it's all good to great to spectacular. It doesn't get any any <laughs> it doesn't get any worse than good. So, I have no real complaints. It's a good game. I definitely recommend it. Again, uh, I hope I hope they continue this series. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun and I will definitely be buying the first one or the next one that comes out right away. So, and I and if more come out, I would definitely recommend you guys putting pressure on Sega to localize that, because I had a lot of fun with this game, and I'm pretty excited for more, even more in the same style. Good stuff. So...
that's about it. That's all I gotta do. I gotta actually have to go to work now. I have to finish some work. So I will catch you guys next time.